Let's start with Paul Smart, who is going to be talking about social machines. Thank you. Thank you. So the topic uh, of my talk is social machines. Um, I spend a proportion of my time working on an EPSRC funded project called Sociam, which is a, a collaborative uh, multi-institutional initiative that involves um, Southampton, my, my own home as the, the lead, but also involves folks here in Edinburgh as well uh, at the University of Oxford. And the main objective that we have in Sociam is to understand a category of systems on the web that we're all familiar with. I mean, um, uh, they, they are systems like Wikipedia, YouTube, Facebook. There seems to, especially with the advent of web 2.0 technologies, this ability to kind of, for people to post information to the web and interact with online information resources, there's been this explosion of uh, systems uh, in which technology is being used to support social participation, interaction, and, and engagement. So, in the first talk I gave on Wednesday, I was talking about big data and new web technologies and, and, and all of that stuff. And in addition to that, of course, we're now living in, uh, we're at a point in our history where people are very tech savvy, most of them are very well educated, um, we have new technologies coming on board. It seems that there is, that our epistemic potential has never been greater. And it seems in particular that we should be able to kind of bring all of these assets and resources together to tackle some really hard problems. So they include things like cancer, climate change, problems with energy, and after the last two days, extended epistemology. <laughs> so these are really hard, intractable problems. And the idea in Sociam is that the web provides new opportunities here. So by exploiting the technologies that we have available, the fact that we now have this, um, this global information space that we can use for information sharing, knowledge exchange, and collaboration, we may be able to kind of harness our collective cognitive capital in a way that we've never been able to do before. And perhaps in terms of finding solutions to these problems, that's the only way that we're going to be able to do it. The problems are just too hard um, to, to be solved in any other way. Now, it's to our internal embarrassment in computer science that um, everyone knows what social machines are, but they're not actually able to define come up with a definition for the term social machines. So I guess in that sense it's something, it's a bit like knowledge, you know, it's kind of, you have this sense of what it means, but you're not a, a able to come up with a definition on which everyone agrees. But the first kind of um, attempt at defining social machines was made by Tim Berners-Lee, the, the inventor of the World Wide Web, and what he argued is that social machines are processes in which the people do the creative work and the machine does the administration. And most people have, have kind of adopted that definition. I think it's wrong. Um, I mean, I think for a start, I don't think social machines can be characterized as processes. I think that's a category error. I think they're systems. Um, I, I'm not, just not sure how it makes sense to think of them as processes. Also, this kind of notion of creative work is a bit problematic, I think. So, I mean, there are systems that people say, this is a social machine, and the system in question is, is something like an evolutionary computation system where the machine is doing a lot of the kind of creative generation of content, and the human contribution is actually somewhat trivial. They're just saying, yes, this is a good design. Um, evolve new designs from that one. And that kind of doesn't quite fit Berners-Lee's vision. There's also this kind of um, sense that... So, so people see Google as a social machine. It's been characterized as a social machine. But a lot of the content that Google has, I mean, although that's kind of derived from human contributions, arguably, the kind of indexing, the actual contents of the database, all of that's kind of machine generated. I mean, no, no human being sat there and kind of typed billions of entries into a database. There were machine processes that went out and kind of gathered that data and organized it. 
So, so then we have another kind of attempt at a definition, much more recent, in this case from Wikipedia. So the attempt here is social machines are an environment comprising humans and technology interacting and producing outputs or action which would not be possible without both parties present. So my own feeling is that that's a bit better, but I have a problem with this notion of not being possible um, because I kind of feel that the system should be defined in terms of its characteristics rather than you know, whether or not it's possible for machines or humans to do it. The problem is that, and I'll kind of talk about this um, a little bit anon, in some cases you start off with a system where the humans are making contributions to machine-based processing and the machine learns from the, what the humans are telling it and to the point where it actually becomes much better than the humans and then you think, well, I don't, actually don't need the humans anymore, I'll just use the machine. That happened in the case, um, uh, for example, of Galaxy Zoo, which I'll talk about. So then you have an example where you start off with a problem that's not possible without human involvement, but then after a little while, you don't need the human participation anymore. But that, to my mind, doesn't stop the original system being a social machine. So I've kind of thrown my own hat into the ring here, and myself and Nigel Shadbolt, who's my, my mentor and has been for many years, so we came up with this definition of um, social machine, machines as socio-technical systems in which the human and technological elements play the role of participant machinery with respect to the mechanistic realisation of system-level processes. So normally I feel supremely confident when, in, when I'm talking about this definition because I'm normally talking to computer scientists who are kind of scratching their head about participant machinery and mechanistic realisation and I now have to confess to feeling quite sheepish because... <laughs> kind of aware that I'm sitting in front of, a, I'm standing in front of a much more well-informed audience. But the, the uh, crucial idea here is to characterise social machines as socio-technical systems and to draw on concepts of extended cognition um, in order to, to, to get some sort of conceptual grasp on what a social machine is as being this kind of complex form of interaction between machine-based processes and human capabilities. And in fact, the notion of participant machinery is drawn from um, uh, the, uh, the fine words of, uh, of Andy Clark when he talks about um, technologically extended forms of human cognition as being this uh, kind of amalgamation of human and machine-based processes or processes that supervene on, on machine and human-based resources. I mean, I have to say just kind of going back to this, that I do think there is a lot of appeal in terms of Berners-Lee's original definition, because it does seem to account for a model on the web that has proved extremely popular. So, and the model is this, that you have a group of technologists, they come up with an infrastructure that enables people to make contributions, to post content or to interact, and that's all they do. They don't bother with the content. They just create the kind of infrastructure. And then they just let people post all the content. So if you think of some of the most popular systems on the web, Wikipedia, uh, YouTube, Facebook, I mean, all of that content in those systems, that's all supplied by the users, not by the designers. The designers are just getting rich off of the work that the humans are doing. So, and there are, as you can see, there are, you know, there's a superabundance of these kinds of systems now. Um, now, of course, not all of these systems are relevant to epistemology. Um, I mean, um, a, a kind of a lot of the adult websites actually um, have benefited from this model, and I couldn't find any articles on, on carnal knowledge on Google Scholar, so I'm assuming that that's not a subject that's of interest in this space. But um, I do think that there are a class of systems that are of epistemic relevance, and I'm going to talk about some of those, and systems as well that I think are of interest from a kind of more distributed cognition kind of perspective, and I'll, I'll talk about that as well. Um, first of all, I just wanted to, to talk about some of the efforts that we've made in order to, to get a, uh, to kind of pin down our concepts of what social machines are and what their characteristics are. And I said that um, the sense is that social machines are only something that can be defined in ostension. So, you know, everyone can point to a social machine, but then you ask them, what do you mean by a social machine? And it's a lot more problematic. 
So, so my approach to this has been to resort to the use of knowledge engineering techniques in order to try and get a feel for what people's intuitions are and try and identify what are the kind of characteristics of social machines that guide our intuitions. Um, and so the approach that I've used, as I said, draws on techniques in knowledge engineering. One of the techniques is called the repertory grid approach. And what you do in this, with this technique is you get some, some examples of social machines. You present the human subject with three of them and you say, you know, in what way are these two randomly chosen social machines different from a third? And they, they, they kind of think about it and then they say, well, you know, this one um, is designed to support social interaction and this one not so much. Um, and that turns out to be a very good approach because if you, sit, if, you, if you ask someone, you know, what are the defining features of a social machine, then they, they, they won't say very much. But once you kind of structure your, 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 your kind of interaction with them using this kind of psychological technique, it, it tends to draw out a lot more uh, useful information. So this repertory grid approach, what, it, what it's designed to do essentially is to elicit dimensions, or you can think of these as features, along which social, social machines differ. And what we do as part of the technique is we elicit these dimensions and then we get the subject to, to rank all of the social machines on a scale. So um, if we just look at the, the top kind of dimension that was elicited, we've got a scale of values at the, the lower end, we've got heterotelic use. It's kind of the worst possible, <laughs> the worst dimension I could have chosen, actually. But heterotelic use um, means uh, something that's used for kind of enjoyment or pleasure. Um, and is that, no, it's the other way around, sorry. So heterotelic use is kind of professional or instrumental uses, whereas autotelic use is more kind of pleasure and enjoyment. So an example of a system that um, is kind of very, that kind of features highly on this dimension is LinkedIn. It's used for kind of professional networking. And at the other end of the spectrum, we have something like YouTube. And then if we kind of say, well, you know, what would you kind of, if we ask the subject, what would you call this? Um, and, you know, they say, well, it's the kind of the motivation that you have for using a particular system. So that's our dimension, motivation type. Now, once we've kind of gone through, once we've spent some time with a subject and gone through all of these um, dimensions, we can then apply some statistical techniques to them. And that gives us what you might see as the beginnings of some sort of taxonomy or conceptual hierarchy. So once we've applied the cluster analysis techniques, we get these two dendrograms, one which applies to uh, the actual uh, um, objects or it, it, under, under investigation, in this case, social machine, and the other dendrogram which gets applied to the kind of features that those objects have. So, you know, there's a, there are a num there's a number of interesting features here. So firstly, um, you've got a group here of statistically similar uh, uh, social machines, Facebook, MySpace, link, LinkedIn, and we can say to the subject, well, you know, these all look similar, what would you call those? And they say, well, they're kind of social networking systems. So that's a kind of category, that's a class, right, of social machines. And then, um, okay, I'll give up on that. Um, then we've got kind of Flickr and YouTube, they're very similar. So we'd ask the subject, what, you know, is there a term that kind of, that, 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 that kind of accommodates both of those? And say, well, there's kind of social media systems. So that's another kind of category. And then in terms of the analysis of the, um, uh, the, uh, the features, we can see we've got this cluster, low net social network salience, low sociality, high anonymity. I mean, that kind of all makes sort of sense. You know, you kind of expect a system that's designed to support social interaction as making the social network quite salient um, and, and also requiring users to say something about themselves um, in order to facilitate the... Um, the development of, of relation, relational intimacy. Um, what we've done, kind of based on that empirical analysis, is, is come up with uh, what we've referred to as a social machine morphospace. The notion of a morphospace is, is taken from biology and originally, I think, paleontology. But the basic idea is that when it comes to kind of biological forms, you can situate 
all the possible designs, morphological designs that an organism could take within a multidimensional space. And in this particular case, this is um, a morpho space designed for shell designs of a unicellular organism. And the reason I've chosen this one is because it only has three dimensions. So you can accommodate all possible shell designs of this organism in a three-dimensional space. And that actually turns out to be surprisingly useful. Um, it gives you a sense, for example, of what the kind of re what regions within that space might constitute a particular conceptual category. It gives you a sense of what kind of designs have been explored by evolution in this case and which have not. Um, and it gives you a sense on um, uh, um, what the kind of um, the kind of similarities are between, um, uh, uh, or what the kind of trajectories are um, for organisms as they move through this space on the evolutionary time. You know, what are the kind of factors that are kind of motivating a shift in design from one point to another? In terms of the, the social machine morpho space, I can't provide a visual representation of that because it's got 33 dimensions. And I think the total design space, when you add in the, um, the possible values that um, social machines can have on these 33 dimensions, the design space turns out to be in the region of 20,000 possible different types of social machine design. So it's a very large space. And of course, we've only, in terms of our design efforts, we've only explored a small fraction of that to date. Um, I mean, one, so one reason why it's kind of useful to have this kind of framework, um, and this is where you know, I kind of tend to think of morphospaces spaces as cognitive scaffolds in a way, is because they kind of undergird your imaginative efforts when you're thinking about new design possibilities. So you've kind of got the morphospace, space, which is this universe of design possibilities uh, for social machines. And you can look at which designs have already been explored by inventors. And what you tend to see is that there are clusters, but between those clusters, there are great voids, great, great expanses of unexplored space. And um, there may very well be kind of useful new designs in there. So it's kind of a, a means of um, enhancing your creativity, if you like. I'm not going to go through the morphospace, space, but I mean, if people are interested, there is a, a paper that's available um, on open access. So the reason I've kind of spent some time talking about that is because everything I've said about social machines could e be applied equally well to concepts of cognitive systems, cognitive processes, and cognitive artifacts. So you can imagine going through exactly the same sort of process to get a sense of what are the, fa what, what are the kind of, uh, as a way of exploring people's intuitions about cognitive systems and cognitive processes and cognitive artifacts. So I'm now going to talk about a few examples of social machines that I think are of um, epistemological significance. So the first one, and the one that people tend to be most familiar with in my experience, are citizen science systems. The most popular platform for citizen science, uh, I suspect, is, is what's known as Zooniverse. So some of you may very well be familiar with this. It's a, it's a, um, a platform uh, uh, that supports the deployment of multiple citizen science projects and it enables people to play an active role in the scientific process. Usually they're kind of involved in analyzing bodies of data that either are too complicated for machine-based processes to do or the scientists just haven't got time to do the, the analysis. And so human, so the general population, society at large, are recruited into the process and they're given tasks that humans tend to be very good at. In the case of Galaxy Zoo, it's recognizing galaxy types from images. And at least initially, it turned out that the state of the art in image processing wasn't sufficient to deal with this. So, and if you think of kind of the results from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, there is a lot of galaxies out there. They're never going to be able to look at all those images. And so what they did is they just put all the images online and said, well, you know, if anyone wants to have a go at this, here you go. <laughs> And it turned out that you know, they had thousands of people who participated. And for some reason, people love spending eight hours a day looking at pictures of galaxies and classifying them. Um, so that's a bit mysterious. But the, the, one of the, the kind of major uh, impacts behind this was, that was something quite unexpected. 
which was that there was an entirely new kind of galaxy out there that astronomers haven't even thought about. It's called the Green Pea Galaxy, and it was discovered by these citizen scientists. So they're kind of looking at these images, and they come across these kind of green anomalies. Nobody knows what they are. They start communicating with each other on chat forums. Does anyone know what this is? I found this a bit strange. Is this a digital artifact? And they say, no, no, I, I saw that as well. And so this discussion goes on, and eventually it gets to the point where um, the astronomers themselves become aware. They say, well, you know, there's all this chat happening in the discussion forums. So they start having a look at the images, and then you get this kind of realization that, that astronomical science has been advanced with the discovery of a new galaxy type. So, so that's kind of one example of how this technology, I think, is of epistemic relevance. There's also a kind of point that I made earlier, which is that um, by virtue of the fact that you've got kind of large numbers of people participating uh, in these processes, you're able to draw on the contributions that they make, and that feeds back into the technology design process. So you know, once you've got this kind of massive database of human annotated images, that's a very powerful a substrate for machine learning. And on the basis of that technique, you can then actually get machines to perform in, as well as the human subjects. So another example um, of um, social machines that do epistemically useful works, human computation systems. So the idea is very similar. Um, some processes uh, that machines are just not that good at but humans tend to be much better at. So we get the machines and the humans to work together in a productive way, and hopefully we make scientific advances. And so this is a screenshot of the Foldit uh, system, which is designed to support the development of new protein folding algorithms by exploiting humans' cap capabilities for conceptions of 3D space and how objects behave in them. <clears throat> and this system, in fact, led to the discovery of a new protein folding algorithm uh, that was published in Nature in 2010, and the authors explicitly credited that discovery to 57,000 participants um, that had provided the, the, the requisite information. And so I think that kind of raises a number of important issues. And, and, and one of those issues is, you know, when we're looking at these kind of systems, who or what deserves the credit for epistemic accomplishments? You know, is it it's not a single human subject in most cases, so it must be a social group. But then you wouldn't actually see those accomplishments if it wasn't for the technology. But then you take the humans away, the technology can't do that much. So it's kind of a mixture of all of these elements combined and the interactions between them. Um, I think it also raises questions about you know, what's, who or what has the ability and, 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 and what is the ability that's being manifested. So it's kind of not obvious that the ability in question is anything that humans have, although those are clearly very important. There's also this kind of sense of you know, new abilities emerging on the basis of the kinds of complementary contributions that machines and humans are making in the context of a, um, uh, uh, an integrated uh, process. And then, you know, in terms of kind of attributions of ability, I, I have to profess, I, I find cognitive agency very mysterious still, but um, my sense is in this space that the, the kind of focus of uh, ability-based descriptions has to be the larger system. It can't just be the, the biological uh, uh, subjects themselves. And so I think there's a basis for kind of saying the system itself has this kind of ability. Whoops. So let me just go back. So the, the systems, um, those two systems that I've talked about, those are systems that, uh, in which humans are making contributions, but the kind of, the, the, the interaction between the human subjects is relatively lightweight, relatively limited. There's no kind of uh, direct communication between human subjects, so to speak. Normally, you've got individuals that are performing the tasks in isolation, they make contributions, and the machine is the thing that does all of the amalgamation and uh, uh, kind of works out whether people are doing the task properly or whether their contributions are just nonsense. But there are also systems that are focused much more on uh, direct 
uh, mediating kind of direct forms of human communication and collaboration. And as an example of uh, this system, uh, I'm going to talk about the latest, uh, I'm just going to present a video of the, um, the latest version of Skype, which is available now, I believe, uh, for download. I think it came out last month. So that's real-time natural language trans translation um, that Microsoft have clearly made a lot of advances on. It's available for download now. Um, and, I mean, one thing to bear in mind here is just something I said earlier about this kind of positive reinforcement cycle. The web has been a tremendous boom for us in terms of natural language processing technology because never before have we had this kind of such a vast amount of training data and analytical data for, hu for, for, for investigating human natural language and really kind of stress testing the kind of algorithms for natural language processing. And a lot of that is now starting to feed into things like real-time translation, narrative generation, uh, conversational agents, um, spoken language under understanding. I mean, there's a whole kind of range of new and exciting linguistic based technologies coming online now. Um, so I'm not, I'm not going to talk in detail about this kind of notion of human extended machine cognition. It was something I talked about um, on Wednesday. But kind of drawing on those kind of examples that, that, that I, I've just mentioned, I think it's kind of important to, to kind of appreciate the, the way in which we have these kind of two disparate sets of uh, capabilities, human capabilities, machine capabilities. And when we think about the kind of the next generation of machine-based intelligence, we, I mean, we've typically thought of, thought of AI as kind of being this, uh, you kind of have to kind of focus on the machine and get the machine to perform as well as possible. But I think kind of looking at the technologies and also kind of feeding off of the ideas and insights that come from the philosophy of mind literature with respect to extended cognition, we also have this kind of new kind of concept of exploiting the human social environment as a means to, to realise new kinds of capabilities for machine intelligence. So where is the focus in uh, kind of um, technology extended human cognition is, you know, what what are the, what, how can we kind of press maximal benefit or maximal co cognitive advantage from the technologies that we use? When we think about machine cognition, we're kind of um, looking at things from the other side. We're looking, at the, we're looking at society from the web's perspective, and we're thinking about what can we as human beings do to, to shape, scaffold, and support the cognitive processes of the machines. I'm just going to talk um, about distributed cognition. So I don't, I, I mean, what's very important is I don't want to create the impression that all social machines are cognitively or epistemically relevant, because that's clearly not the case. But there are, clear, there are, I think, an important subset of social machines that are specifically concerned with the performance of cognitively relevant activities. And I think these kinds of systems um, uh, should be uh, treated as examples of distributed cognition. I mean, that seems to make sense. They are socio-technical systems that seem to uh, be engaged in the realisation of cognitive processes. And from an engineering perspective, there are a whole range of challenging issues concerned with how we engineer the systems in the first place and then how we get, configure them to get them to perform uh, optimally. And so one of the issues in terms of design uh, that we typically start thinking about um, is we look at kind of human cognitive capabilities and we think, well, there are some shortcomings here. So when we think of memory, it's limited and selective, could be improved. When we look at human reasoning, um, we see this kind of interesting phenomenon whereby uh, apparently, according to Mercer and Sperber, we're very good, uh, we're, sorry, we're not very good at spotting problems and, uh, with our own arguments and flaws in our own reasoning. But we're absolutely fantastic at nailing other people to the cross. Um, and so there's this kind of asymmetry um, that, that may kind of have its origins in, 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 in our evolutionary um, past. 
And then we also see this kind of range of cognitive biases. So we've got these things like confirmation bias, uh, whereby we tend to focus on particular bodies of evidence that support our pre-existing kind of hypotheses and, and, and views. And so you might say, well, you know, we've got all these great technologies to hand, and we've got this kind of notion of extended minds. Let's just engineer these shortcomings out. Let's enhance individual uh, human cognition, and we're going to get we're going to get much more sophisticated human beings, and presumably we will get much more sophisticated uh, groups of individuals, kind of distributed cognitive systems. And actually, I think it's not quite as straightforward as that. So. When we think about those kinds of shortcomings, I mean, it's true that if you think about them in an individual sense, they emerge as deficits. But what about if you think about them in a social context and situate them in that kind of context? So if you think about the kind of reasoning flaws, um, if it was the case that um, uh, we all, um, we, that we didn't kind of have this kind of apparent shortcoming whereby we um, uh, we tend to kind of focus on particular parts of the possible sp uh, space of thoughts and, and kind of reason-directed uh, ideas. I mean, that space is so vast for a lot of problems that we wouldn't be able to cover it. And the chances are that if we were all... Uh, um, if, if we didn't have the kind of biases that we do, we'd try to cover everything and end up covering things at a very superficial level. And the same is true with confirmation bias, of course. Um, confirmation bias functions to kind of limit your attentions to part of the attention to part of the information space. If you didn't have that, then all of us would try to cover everything, and we'd do so very superficially. But if each of us just focuses on one particular part of the problem space of efforts in the most optimal or efficient way, that's that's kind of the sense. So what I want to suggest is that we all have epistemic vices. They're kind of inbuilt. But those individual level epistemic vices, I want to suggest, actually contribute to group level epistemic virtues. They're things that make um, the uh, uh, groups function in an epistemically virtuous way. So on that basis, we should be quite cautious when it comes to kind of enhancing the cognitive capabilities of, um, of individuals. But moving beyond that, you might say, well, even if you're not going to kind of enhance the cognitive capabilities of the, of the individual, maybe there's still this case to be made for enhancing the interaction between them. And certainly a lot of the kind of areas that I work in, the primary drivers of technological innovation and change are things like more bandwidth, faster communication, more communication, everything is better. But if we look at the lessons from cognitive science, it turns out that actually more communication is not always better. So Hutchins, Hutchins did some, Edwin Hutchins did some work in the early 1990s using computer simulation techniques and he was specifically investigating the phenomenon of confirmation bias. And what he observed is that when you have uh, very dense, uh, high-frequency communication between agents. Actually, what you see is greater levels of confirmation bias at the, confirmation, uh, the collective level than you do at the individual level. And the reason for that seems to be that um, uh, kind of sharing information and communicating information early on in a problem-solving process leads everyone to converge on the same set of ideas. There's no kind of People don't um, remain independent and kind of independently explore different parts of the space. They all kind of converge on one solution, and then it kind of seems they're not able to break out of that. And so there seems to be this kind of argument for saying you should perhaps limit the kind of level of communication that you have, um, at least during the early or the initial stages of a problem-solving process. Now, some more recent work by my colleagues at Carnegie Mellon has been looking at control mechanisms for um, determining when humans should communicate with one another. And the research that they've done is actually, I mean, very, very good, um, very important, I think. Um, 
it's going to be impossible for me to give much of a flavor of the research uh, in, in this talk, but, but one thing that, that does seem to be important and has come out of their work is this idea that actually the best thing to do is just to leave it to the human subjects. So when you try to enforce a communication policy on the human subjects, you tend to see suboptimal levels of collaborative performance. But when you just leave it to the human subjects and, and they are kind of in control of when they're going to communicate, what they're going to communicate, then you tend to see best level, the best levels of performance. And just being at this event and, and talking with um, Robert over the last few days has reminded me that um, Robert and um, uh, his colleague Morse had actually kind of looked at something a little bit similar in, in 2005, this, which is this kind of notion of autonomous coupling. So Robert was actually using neural networks um, and, and was looking at the way in which linguistic stimuli could uh, scaffold um, uh, the capabilities of neural networks uh, um, based on, on, on autonomous gating principles. And so I think there's kind of, there is a, an analogy here um, well, you know, the, the work by Close and Morse was done at the level of individual agents. This is kind of obviously pitched in the social domain, but there does some, seem to be something interesting about that kind of autonomous um, uh, 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 gating or kind of autonomous ability to regulate information flows. And, and then listening to Andy's talk yesterday made me kind of wonder whether... Um, the kinds of things that he was talking about in terms of predictive processing, whether this kind of um, uh, feature may actually be, be linked to, 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 to what he was talking about, that predictive systems actually, they're able to kind of function very well in these kinds of um, contexts. Um, so what are we doing to kind of try and make progress here? Um, the approach that, that, that I'm trying to adopt in conjunction with, with colleagues at Carnegie Mellon and IBM is to use computer simulation techniques to try and explore the, the space of possible social machine designs that are particularly relevant to uh, epistemic and cognitive capabilities and get some kind of feel as to how the... Um, uh, 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 the design configuration options and also the features of human cognition and social communication, how they affect performance, collective performance, in um, a, a collective or, or social context. And what we're doing here is we're using cognitive uh, modeling techniques in conjunction with agent simulation and uh, virtual environments, and we're starting to get some, some interesting results coming through now, which should appear in the literature later on in the year. So I'm, I'm running a little bit short on time, so I'm going to try and wrap things up. Um, so that's a, a, a kind of very brief overview of social machines, some of the problems we're having, some of the, the issues that are, I think are at stake in terms of situating this with or interfacing this with cognitive science and, and uh, the philosophy of knowledge. What I wanted to, to kind of just conclude with was this, um, something that's kind of occurred to me over the last few days, which is this kind of sense in which, as I said at the outset, extended epistemology seems to be this kind of really big problem. Um, and if I think about my own capabilities for dealing with it, it's obviously very limited. So. Um, so the, the question is, well, you know, it's not humanly possible for me to make progress in this domain, but <laughs> by virtue of coupling myself to machines, exploiting representations, building machine intelligence to scaffold and support my thinking, perhaps there is a way in which my extended mind might be able to cope much better with this. And I think, as well, in addition to that, talking about social machines, there's also, it's also important to try and think about the way in which you might kind of apply these technologies to um, these philosophical issues. You know, how can you progress philosophical debate, if at all, um, by relying on, on these kinds of emerging technologies? So I already talked about kind of the use of repertory grids and how and if you, kind of, if you sit and think about, well, what are my intuitions about cognitive systems, you're really struggling. But if you kind of structure that within the context of these kind of psychological techniques from knowledge engineering, I think you fare much better. And it enables you to kind of begin to, to structure and create um, 
more formal representations like taxonomic frameworks uh, that can then structure further thinking both yourself and, and, and for others in the community. Um, I talked on Wednesday about semantic web technologies, kind of uh, building knowledge representations using emerging web technologies that enable machines to reason and understand, reason about information and understand information. And so I got up early this morning and, and had a go at just kind of um, taking the kinds of concepts that, 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 that I've kind of extracted from the literature from the last couple of weeks and also from the last few days and try to kind of put them in a form that a machine can then begin to reason about. So this is um, a computational ontology or the beginnings of a computational ontology. And the aim is that you kind of represent concepts and you try to make the semantics behind those concepts explicit. So you're providing logical characterizations of concepts. And the advantage of doing that is that you're able to then delegate some of the reasoning associated with the computation of logical entailments, the detection of logical consistencies. That's all done with the machine. And, and it's, you know, it's kind of beyond my ability. Once you've kind of got this space with potentially hundreds or thousands of concepts, it's not possible for you to really do that without this kind of form of external scaffolding. So the kind of interaction that you have here with these technologies is, I think, justifiably referred to as a form of cognitive extension. It's scaffolding your own ability to reason and think about these things, hopefully in a productive way, but importantly in a, in a way that combines your own biologically based capabilities with the kind of, the kind of brute logical computational power of a, of a conventional computing system. And then the final thing to say is, when we're thinking about social machines, I think it's worth thinking about a variety of technological approaches. Um, I know philosophers work in a very different way, so, um, but there are, so, there are clear examples. So we have kind of technologies to support the collaborative construction of these computational ontologies. We have systems to support collective sense and sense making, enabling individuals to make sense of ambiguous or confusing information. And then there are argumentation systems that enable people to engage in rational debate and also enable them to co-opt machines into that argumentative process as well. So, so in conclusion, um, so I talked about a little bit about ability and I think when we think about social machines and particularly distributed cognitive systems, there's this issue about um, what the abilities of that system are and um, what contribution they're making to epistemic or cognitive outcomes. And importantly, um, you know, who or what should, to, to, what should we, who, who should we ascribe the ability to? Is it the, in, the individuals? Is it the social group? Is it the technologies? Or is it what I think seems to be the most plausible, the larger system? In terms of epistemic virtue, I talked a little bit about the way in which our own kind of epistemic and cognitive shortcomings may actually play a productive role when you situate them in a social context. So there's this kind of question, you know, I have epistemic vices, actually I have quite a lot of advice, vices beyond the epistemological domain, but is it the case that we, we kind of have these epistemic vices, but they're actually also epistemic virtues when you situate them in a collective or social context? Um, and when we're thinking about distributed cognitive systems and we're talking about these kind of extended realization bases, does that give us, does that provide any basis for this kind of notion of extended, ext uh, extended epistemic virtue, that epistemic virtues are actually uh, realized by extended supervenience bases? I mean, if it's the case that um, a social machine can be epistemic, epistemically virtuous, it seems to me to make sense to conclude that that there is some mileage in that idea that you do have a form of extended epistemic virtue. Um, so reliable belief forming processes. Uh, yeah, so I mean, when it comes to kind of engineering systems that are capable of contributing to belief formation, we want those systems to be reliable. I think there's a lot of work to be done here. As I said, there are kind of a lot of issues to think about in terms of how much do you want to enhance the human 
elements of the, the socio-technical system? Uh, uh, what kind of mechanisms, if any, do you want to do to regulate communication between the agents? And it's even more complicated because you do see kind of task-specific uh, issues arise in there. So what's good in one task context may not necessarily be good in another. And I talked very briefly about the approaches that we're currently taking using computational simulation techniques. And then finally, what I talked about very briefly is this idea of using uh, extended minds and extended cognitive systems, real cognitive, extended cognitive systems, in order to make progress um, in uh, these, these kind of very hard areas of philosophy, um, so particularly extended epistemology, but also I think more broadly, issues to do with cognitive systems, uh, cognitive processes, and kind of mysterious nature of mind itself. That's it.